Please be seated. This week, I will reach my five-year anniversary of being with you, the good people of St. Mark's. While I stand in this pulpit and preach to three cameras, it is your faces that I am imagining. Your smiles, your frowns, your laughter, and your silence when my joke does not hit the mark. I'm imagining our small children of our community who usually choose this time to practice their newly found vocal cords and legs. That is all to say, I miss you. For the past five years, I have stood in this pulpit and preached on our Gospels. I believe that as followers of Jesus, we need to love our Gospels and know them in our core in order to be Christians in our everyday lives. I still believe this. I am also noticing inside me a rumbling to find ways to lift up voices that are silenced or ignored and tell their stories, including those voices ignored in our lectionary, the assigned readings for today. I am noticing a rumbling to wrestle with the hard parts of our Christian history, the parts we'd all rather ignore. What Tom just read in the first book of our Bible, Genesis, is hard. It is hard and it is a perfect opportunity to lift up those unheard voices. In this case, the voices of the women. I considered skipping it all together because I'm not going to be able to make this sacred story any easier by the end of this homily. And my voices of doubt, the ones that I've described before to you as ones with crazy hair, reminded me that I am not an expert on Genesis. They reminded me that I'm not going to get everything right, whatever that means and that someone may be offended at the end. What I'm hearing loud and clear from our Holy Spirit moving among us right now is that it is privilege to opt out of talking about hard things. And if we don't take the next step in hard conversations, if we let our fear of our limited perspective and error keep us from trying we don't move forward. We don't join God's action in our world. And so today, I will practice imperfectly with you all talking about hard stories. Two Sundays ago, we met Jacob as he tricked his elder brother Esau out of his birthright. Jacob then goes on to trick his father Isaac to give him Esau's blessing. Esau should have received this blessing as the eldest, and he was under, understandably upset with his younger brother. These actions caused Jacob to move out of town and seek a wife in another land. Today we pick up on the story with Jacob speaking with Laban about marriage and Jacob's choice for a bride. A tidy way to wrap up the story that we just heard is that justice is served to Jacob. The trickster Jacob is now the tricked. Jacob was tricked with that which he used for his own gain before, birthright and birth order. But to stop there would be to ignore the women used as property in this trick. Laban's two daughters, Leah and Rachel, and their two slave girls, Zilpah and Bilhah. Bilhah is named later in the story. The translation of maid in today's reading implies more agency than Bilhah and Zilpah live with. Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah became the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Each of these women deserve to have their own stories heard, preached, and explored. 
Time today will only allow for one of them, and so we begin with Rachel. Rachel makes her entrance in Genesis as a shepherd. A fact that I had missed until two weeks ago due to my own inattention and that the translation we often read translates it a little bit wrong. Shepherds are a powerful metaphor in our sacred text for leading God's people. Today, we still use this metaphor when we call our leaders pastors. In a time where women were often treated as property, Rachel is introduced to us and to Jacob as a woman who holds some power. From Rachel and Jacob's meeting through today's story, we hear several times that Jacob loves Rachel. Romantic love is unusual in this time, and it is to be noted. However, what we don't hear is how Rachel feels about Jacob. We, in fact, are told so little about Rachel. What is Rachel's relationship with Jacob during their seven-year betrothal? Does she even know that she's betrothed? Do they shepherd together during this time? Where is Rachel's mother in a story where we meet so many characters? What is Rachel and Leah's relationship as sisters during this time? Once the seven years are over, are Rachel and Leah an active part of Jacob's deception? If so, why? If not, how does Laban pull it off? There is space in these questions for holy imagination. Holy imagination allows God to move in the silence as we wonder about the voices we haven't heard. Holy imagination does not replace our sacred text, but engages them and finds a way to make them come alive in our lives. Our Jewish siblings call this practice midrash. The Reverend Dr. Wilda Gaffney, in her book, Womenist Midrash, imagines answers to these questions with a story that I'm going to share. Dr. Gaffney writes, Rachel and Leah were ordinary sisters. They had largely separate lives. Leah preferred indoor life, and Rachel preferred outdoor life. Neither was much interested in marriage. Following the rules of the household established by Milka, their great-grandmother, whose name their grandfather, Bethuel ben Milka, bore, they were asked if they would marry each time a suitor came forward, as their Aunt Rebecca had been asked. And each time they said no. Then one day their cousin Jacob came to town looking for a woman from their family, his family. Their father said one of them would have to marry him. Auntie Rebecca would not take no for an answer. Jacob asked for Rachel and offered seven years of his labor in exchange for her. She spent the seven years getting to know him, but she never came to love him. He turned to Leah to help him win her over. The more he pursued her, the less interested she became. The more time he spent with Leah, the more she came to love him. When the time for the wedding feast and consummation came, Leah and Rachel agreed to switch places and told their father what they had decided. They waited until deepest night and put out all the lamps in the wedding tent. Leah hoped that Jacob would realize that it was she whom he truly loved. Jacob was angry and disappointed. He demanded Rachel, Laban tried to dissuade him. Rachel hoped he would give up, but he stayed another seven years. Jacob's pursuit of Rachel broke Leah's heart. The love she held for him and for her sister soured. When Rachel finally consented to marry Jacob, she was at the end of her childbearing years. He did not care. He wanted her and finally had her. That Rachel still did not want him, and that he never wanted Leah, wounded Leah deeply. 
Leah carried that hurt to her grave. She held on to and acted out of her deep hurt. She was never reconciled to her sister. Our modern sensibilities may worry that because this sacred story, this midrash, wasn't written down at the time it happened, it can't possibly be true. Truth, though, when they were writing Genesis was not about what can be proven in a lab. It was about what reveals God in our world. The practice of holy imagination reveals God in reminding us that there are always other perspectives to stories that we know. Those voices, in particular the ones that have been excluded, may challenge our beloved stories, and still they need to be heard. Holy imagination is a spiritual practice that lifts up those voices in our sacred stories in order that we can learn and practice to listen for them in our lives. The story of Rachel and Jacob and their family is complicated. Rachel and Leah name that they no longer have loyalty to their father Laban as he used them as property. Rachel despairs for years at her infertility until God blesses her with her first son, Joseph, the one most commonly known today for his coat and the musical written about him. Leah is blessed by God with many, many children, and yet she is always seeking more love. Zilpah and Bilhah, although shown a sign of respect by being called by name in this story, have no agency over their bodies. This is not a Hollywood story. This is a story about a dysfunctional family, about a family with sibling rivalry, where the value of women is based on her beauty and her ability to have children. This is about those struggles with infertility and unequal rights of women. This is also a story about a dysfunctional family that God blesses time and again. Not a story to emulate, but a story where we see the broken parts of ourselves and our world reflected. And in some of those moments, we may glimpse that we are not alone. Through Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah, we see that those people society does not value, God lifts up and loves as God's own beloved children. This does not excuse bad behavior or unjust structures of power. Instead, it shows us that they are nothing in comparison to God's kingdom here on earth. They show us what God's kingdom could be right now. Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah are the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. In that way, they are our spiritual mothers still, and through these women, we are blessed. Even with that blessing, this story breaks my heart, and that's why I share it with you today.